Hello, we have a couple of people joining us already. Perfect. Oh, quite a few people. That's great. For those of you who have already joined uh, the meeting, if you could just let me know whether the volume is okay, whether you can hear me okay, see me okay, that would be really great. You could just let me know in the chat. That would be awesome. We'll get started at one. Hit the actual content. People are joining. This is good. Someone says, sounds good. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for joining everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a speech and language therapist. So this webinar is going to be from a speech and language therapy point of view today. Um, but if you're joining, if you're not a speech and language therapist, or if you are a speech and language therapist, I'd love to know where you're from, who you are, just to give me an idea of who my audience is today. Maybe you're a parent of a child with autism. Let's see. Occupational therapist, excellent. I love occupational therapists. I have a colleague I work really closely with who's an OT, and so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about her today. I have learned a lot from OTs. Oh, a family doctor, GP? Oh, great. That's the first uh, family doctor I've had joining my webinars. A maths teacher, okay, interesting. Another OT, excellent. A music teacher, oh, cool. This is going to be relevant for you. We are going to talk a little bit about music today. And a parent of a special needs adult son, great. Psychologist. Oh, these are coming in fast. Hold on a sec. A teacher, a special ed teacher. Oh, someone using the forebrain. That's great. Glad to know that you already use it. Another OT, another SLT. Perfect. This is really good. Um, just for those of you who are writing in the chat, if you could just make sure that your um, settings are set to all panelists and attendees. That way everyone will be able to see your messages, not just me. That would be good. A pharmacist, okay, interesting. And a, a mom of uh, an autistic child, perfect. So I'm gonna be talking today for like maybe roughly 40 minutes. I actually haven't timed this one, so I'm not sure, but I feel like it will be about 40 minutes. And then we're gonna have about 20 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So if you have a question to ask during the webinar, feel free to put it either in the chat or in the little Q&A. Um, and I will look at those at the end. I'm not going to be able to look at them while we're doing the webinar. It's just going to be too much to organize, but I will look at them at the end and I'll um, answer you if I can. If there are questions that I don't have answers for today, I'll do a follow-up email after the webinar sometime, probably either later this week or early next week. Okay, so I think we're going to get started. Let me just share my screen. Okay, here we go, perfect. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about using forebrain in speech and language therapy. This is the third part of the webinar series I've been doing about using forebrain as a speech and language therapist. And today we're gonna to be talking about using forebrain with children with autistic spectrum disorder. So the first webinar I did was on children with language delays. The second one was on speech sound disorders. And today we're gonna to be talking about ASD. So let's get into it. So who am I? Well, my name is Grace. I am a speech and language therapist, like I already mentioned, and I'm from New Zealand. I grew up in New Zealand and I did all of my training there. And then a couple of years after graduating, I moved to France and I set up my private practice in France. And I've been working here for about seven years now. I work mostly in early intervention. So I work a lot with language delay, speech sound disorders and autistic spectrum disorder, which is why I chose those topics for my, my webinars. Um, I do in clinic visits, I have a clinic space, which you're gonna see some photos of in this webinar. And I also do a lot of um, home-based services as well. And I was introduced to Forebrain at the end of 2017 by my occupational therapist colleague. And I just thought it was a really, really interesting use of technology. And I thought that could be really beneficial to some of my clients. So I was very curious and I've been using it ever since. So coming up three years now. So I really love having it as a part of my therapist toolkit. So I just wanted to share with you some of the ways that I use it in my sessions. So to start with, what is Forebrain? Well, I have mine here today, we can see. So it's this little headset. And we have three parts. So we have our microphone. We have this dynamic speech filter. Whoop. And then we have these little blue discs here, 
which use bone conduction. So what happens, you put it on, it goes behind your ears. It's kind of funny. So you have that little thing just sitting on the bone right in front of your ear, not actually sitting on your ear. And then you have the microphone about three centimeters away from your mouth is ideal. And so what happens is when you speak, the microphone picks up your voice, the, the speech message gets filtered through the dynamic speech filter, and then these little blue discs vibrate and use bone conduction to stimulate your auditory nerve directly. So what ends up happening is that you hear yourself in real time, but just slightly louder. It's a really, really unusual sensation and there's really nothing quite like it. So if you haven't tried wearing a forebrain, I would definitely recommend it. It's a really interesting, unusual sensation. When we're looking at this device as speech and language therapists, we call it an altered auditory feedback device. And the way that it alters our auditory feedback is by amplifying our speech in real time. Um, we can turn it on and off like this. If it's got the little blue dot, that means it's on or off. And then you can also adjust the volume. So you can choose how loud or how quiet you want it to amplify your speech. When we're using this device, we're going to remember that it's designed to be a complementary tool. So it's not meant to replace anything that we're already doing. It's just meant to enhance our evidence-based practice that we're already using as therapists. One of the things that the forebrain does is it uses this thing called the auditory vocal loop. So the auditory vocal loop is a natural process that we all do when we speak. I'm doing it right now. This is when we speak, um, we perceive our voice, so we hear ourselves. We analyze what we've just heard, and then we're able to adjust what, we've, what we're saying based on what we've kind of heard and analyzed. So one thing that the forebrain does is it makes this process a little bit easier because it enhances part of it. It enhances the perception part of this process. So we speak and we can per perceive ourselves a little bit clearer, a little bit louder, thanks to the forebrain, which just makes that analysis and adjusting process a little bit easier. So the population that we're going to be talking about today, I have to admit to you guys, I um, said I would do these three webinars and I thought that's great. I know about this topic, autistic spectrum disorder. And then when it came to actually writing the content for this webinar, I was like, oh my goodness, I have bitten off more than I can chew because this is just such a huge topic. If you work with people with autistic spectrum disorder, you know, it's just a huge spectrum like I might as well have just said this is about working with children like it's just so so broad. So we are going to go a little bit in depth on some things, some things we're going to go really broadly on. Um, yeah, it was a tricky, it was a tricky topic to write about today, but that's okay. So autistic spectrum disorder. So the diagnosis has changed for ASD from when I was in school. Um, in the latest version of the DSM, they classify autistic spectrum disorder with three levels. So you have level one, which is your maybe milder ASD. So that might have been the kids who were previously diagnosed as more like Asperger's would kind of fit in that level. Then level two is more moderate and then level three is more severe. And in this diagnosis, we have two distinctive parts. So the first one, is difficulty with social communication. So that could be things like social or emotional reciprocity. It could include verbal and nonverbal communication. So both spoken language and then also body language or facial expressions. And then difficulty with relationships. Maybe up at the level one um, level of ASD, people might want to build relationships but not really know how. Or maybe at the level two or the level three level of ASD, they might not even just be that interested in building relationships. And then the other side is to do with restrictive or repetitive behaviors. So this can include things like stereotypy. So these are the kind of typical things when we see autism portrayed in movies or on TV, um, these kind of stereotypical like flapping of the hands or lining things up in a row, those types of behaviors. We also see an inflexibility. So this is to do with things like routines. Children with ASD or people with ASD can be really rigid and really inflexible and it can be really difficult for them to accept that something's different or that something has changed. We see fixated interests. So these can be, these are, can be interesting. Sometimes these can be really functional. Um, I have a little cousin who is on the autistic spectrum disorder. And ever since he was really, really small, he's been absolutely obsessed with trains. He would buy games. He would look at the train timetable, just completely obsessed with trains. Um, but he's a teenager now and he's actually looking at going in and wanting to be a train driver. So for him, that's kind of a functional fixated interest. But then I have, um, 
an interest that's maybe not so functional is I have a 22 year old who I'm working with at the moment and he is really obsessed with blues clues. And so for 20 year, 22 year old, that's maybe less of a functional interest than something like trains. So it can go both ways. It could be something functional or not so functional for the fixated interests. And then also difficulty with sensory processing. So again, there's two sides to this coin. Um, children with ASD could be hyposensitive and need more sensory input, or they could be hypersensitive and be really overwhelmed by noises or lights or, or the environment. Um, can really go both ways and it will really differ depending on the child. If you want more information about the diagnostic criteria, I have put a little link at the bottom that you can check out later on. So when we're introducing forebrain, for the other two topics that we talked about for language delay and for speech sound disorders, we talked a lot about when we introduce forebrain to use an excited voice, excited facial expressions. That just doesn't work so well with our kids with ASD. They just don't really care as much about us being excited about it. So what I find works best if I'm introducing forebrain to a child with ASD is just using distractors. So you can see here, I'm working with little Aiden over here. Um, and our distractor is this crocodile dentist. So it's just something to keep his hands busy and keep him occupied so he's not focused on this kind of unusual sensation of having something around his ears. I can also use the parent as a shadow or I could be the shadow depending on um, if the, the child is more anxious about working with me and would rather work with the parent. So one of us would pop behind the child, put their forebrain on their head while the other one is in front of the child and distracting them with some type of toys. Another strategy would be to keep the volume down really low or even off to begin with. So some children that maybe that more hypersensitive children um, might have a difficult time with even just having the sensation of something sitting on their ears. And so having that sensation of something touching your head and touching your ears and having that extra volume piece might just be completely overwhelming. So we could start with the volume off or the volume very low and then gradually increase the volume as the child becomes to tolerate the forebrain a little bit more. And then we also have to consider that it's not going to be appropriate for some children with ASD. No tool is a one size fits all tool and the forebrain is just the same. So I have found that for ASD more so than any other population that I use forebrain with, that the children either love it and do fantastically with it or like hate it and want to have nothing to do with it. And that's fine. We're not gonna to want to distress a child in therapy. So if a child is really, really distressed by using the forebrain, we're not gonna use it. We're gonna find a different strategy for that child. But then on the other hand, the ones that do love it, do do really well when they wear it. And we'll talk a little bit about that some more later on. So these are the daily recommendations for how long we should wear forebrain according to the forebrain website. So they recommend 10 minutes per day for children under five and 15 minutes per day for children aged five to 15. I like to try and get this in like a block of time. So um, a 10 minute solid block of wearing the forebrain rather than like one minute here, one minute there. But if that's all you can get, that's fine too. I've also had children who love wearing the forebrain, especially children with ASD who like wearing the forebrain. They really love wearing it and they will want to keep it on longer than the 10 or 15 minutes, depending on their age. So use your clinical judgment in these cases. Um, I will let the child wear it for a little bit longer if they're really loving it and enjoying it and it's working well for them. I will let them wear it for a little bit longer, but you really have to use your clinical judgment on that one. So how to use forebrain in speech and language therapy? Well, I mean, basically, we said it's a complementary tool. It's gonna to be used alongside our other evidence-based practices. So basically, we're just gonna be doing what we're already doing, but we're using the forebrain at the same time. And I could just stop it there. We could end the webinar and that could be it because I could just say, do what you're doing, but use the forebrain. But I will give you some specific examples of the activities that I do in my sessions. So I like to warm up with movement. And this is a trick that I learned from my occupational therapist colleague. Um, I find it just so, so beneficial, no matter which type of child I'm working with, but especially children with autistic spectrum disorder. So this helps to regulate the body and it helps to get them kind of out of their heads or maybe out of their stimming, looking around kind of in their heads and into their body, feeling more grounded and more ready. And I feel like it helps to get them in the zone for therapy. It's also really enjoyable, fun way to start a session. So some of the ways I'll do this, um, I could start with full body movements. So if I'm working with a child who is able to follow directions a little bit, we could do things like animal walks. So pretending to be an elephant and like stomp across the room and swing your trunk. 
we could pretend to be a giraffe and walk really tall with our arms up. We could pretend to be a snake and slither on our bellies. Those are some really nice full body movements. If the child is not able to follow directions as well, I really love an obstacle course. And that's what I've set up here for Rayhan. So Rayhan's obstacle course here, he had to start at the swing. He had to like pull himself across it, get to the end of the swing, which is where he's at now go across the stepping stones. Um, these are OT stepping stones. So they're all like funny um, textures, funny, like they wobble, they spin, they're kind of difficult to walk on. And then back through the tunnel. And we'll do that obstacle course maybe like three or five times, just slow rhythmically getting him into the rhythm of it. If that's too difficult, we could also just use a swing. So I have a swing set up here. We can just have the child sit on the swing and swing them back and forth. We could also use a hammock. Um, I actually love using these lycra hammocks for children with ASD. It's that kind of stretchy lycra and when you lie in it, it kind of envelops you like this all behind you and it feels like you're getting a kind of big squishy hug from behind. So children who are maybe hyposensitive and like are a little bit more sensory seeking, lying in that hammock can be a really, really nice sensation for them. Or we could use a yoga ball. And this is a great option for when you're working at home with a family, because I mean, not all families will have a swing or a hammock set up inside their house, but getting a yoga ball is maybe a more realistic goal. So we can either have the child just sit on the yoga ball and bounce them, or we could have them lie on the yoga ball with their belly and kind of rock them back and forth and get their head going down and head coming back up. When we are doing any of these swing hammock yoga ball type movements, we're not wanting to make it kind of this crazy disorganized dysregulating movement. We're wanting it to be quite rhythmic and calming and just kind of get the child moving and get their vestibular system going. Um, what's great about the forebrain is if we're doing these things, we can still be wearing the forebrain. I didn't have Rayhan wearing it here because the one thing that the forebrain doesn't do so well in is the tunnel. It kind of, it, the sound in there is not great for wearing the forebrain. Um, but if we're doing the animal walks, the obstacle course, or the swing hammock or yoga ball, we can be wearing the forebrain because it's wireless. So it's really nice to use if we're moving around. If this is a part of the session where the child is quite vocal, it can be a great opportunity to use the forebrain. Another thing I would like to do is to use sensory massage. I don't know if this is the official term. I'm just making up words here. Uh, I call it sensory massage. Um, my occupational therapist colleague taught me about the Wilbarger brushing protocol and joint compression. So if you're unfamiliar with this, I really would recommend looking at it. It's where you compress the joints. I can't really imitate it on myself, but you kind of place two hands, like one under the elbow and one at the shoulder, and you kind of push the joints together. And then you do this kind of brushing motion with the special brush. Um, it's a really, really nice activity to do throughout the day, but I also like to do it at the start of my sessions with my clients. Or I will use something simple like sensory toys like I have here with Ines. Um, these, I have one here today actually. It's the exact one I have in the photo. It's like a big squishy kind of sensory toy. You can squeeze it, it has a nice texture. And I'll kind of warm up Ines's body with the sensory toy. He loves this as a warm up activity. So putting it on his hands, squishing it on his arms, on his feet, on his legs, on his back, even on his head, he doesn't love that so much. Um, but just kind of waking up the body and getting the child into their body. And you can see same thing, Ines here is wearing the forebrain when we we're doing this activity. Um, he has an iPad that he uses to communicate. He's nonverbal. He will make vocalizations, but he's nonverbal. But this is an activity where he will sometimes vocalize. So I do like to have the forebrain on him while we do this activity. Another thing that I like to use when I'm working with children with ASD is applied behavior analysis. And this is obviously a really big um, evidence-based practice method. Um, I worked as little bit as an ABA teacher when I first arrived in France. I had absolutely no training in ABA at the time. I just found a position on a team working for two boys who had autistic spectrum disorder. And so I learned on the job and I found it really, really benef beneficial to learn about the ABA principles of reinforcement and extinction. I find this so, so important. And I wish we learned about it more as speech and language therapists. So that's why I wanted to talk about it a little today. So reinforcement is just the ways that we reinforce desirable, desirable behaviors. So we always want to make sure that the child is motivated to be in therapy with us by making sure that we have something reinforcing and fun and motivating for them. So if we're working with an older child, like here I'm working with Rayhan, he's working on some articulation, his n versus his ch sound, he gets those two a little bit confused, kind of strange, um, but that's okay. We have this reinforcer here for him, which is this funny dog game, which he loves. You can see him giggling in the picture. What this 
dog does is you have to like steal the bones from his little bowl. And then if you push the bowl too hard, the dog like jumps up and like scares you. It's actually really, really terrifying. I've had a fright being an adult. So it's a big adrenaline rush, but he finds this really reinforcing and this motivates him to stay in the activity with us. So that's like an external reinforcement. That's something extra that we add to the activity, but we could also have activities that are intrinsically reinforcing for the child. So that might be something like jumping or spinning or swinging when just the sensation of that activity is reinforcing for the child. And then extinction. So extinction is talking about negative behaviors or non-functional behaviors that we don't want the child to do anymore. So just knowing how to extinguish those and make sure that we're not inadvertently reinforcing those behaviors and kind of making them stick around for longer. If you're unfamiliar with ABA and the principles of reinforcement and extinction, I really do recommend that you read on it a little bit because it's really, really important for all therapists. When I'm working with children with ASD, um, I always like to work on interaction first if we're working in early intervention. So this just means enjoying interactions with a communication partner. And the communication partner might be me, the therapist, it might be the parents, it might be a sibling, or if we're in a school setting, it maybe it's a peer. But just really working on that interaction piece first before you begin working on any academic goals or anything like that. So th some things that we might include are eye contact, joint attention, and turn taking. A little caveat for eye contact. I know that some children with autistic spectrum disorder do find eye contact to be distressing. So we don't always have to insist on that. Just if they, they seem like they could do it or they might enjoy it, then I will work on eye contact. But otherwise, joint attention and turn taking we can also work on for that interaction piece. When it comes to adding language to interaction, we do want to avoid shapes, colors, letters, and numbers. That's purely because those types of words are more academic and less to do with functional language. Um, functional language would be more like nouns, verbs, and adjectives, the things that we kind of use to make phrases. Um, the only th thing I would say on that is if the child is only interested in shapes, colors, letters, and numbers. For example, I have a little boy around here who I work with who is absolutely obsessed with letters and numbers. That's really his big main interests. Then I will use it in speech and language therapy, but I will kind of turn it into a social activity. So we'll get either like a, an alphabet puzzle, take all the letters out, put them in the hammock, and he has to like request for me to go up into the hammock to find a piece, bring it back over to his puzzle. So turning something that could have been like an independent activity where he's just looking at his puzzle, putting his letters in, into a more social activity where we're moving and he's got that piece where he has to ask me to go up into the hammock and then come back down. So avoid shapes, colors, letters, numbers, or if you can't, use them in a social activity. So speaking about social activities, um, these for me are activities that require a therapist or parent. They're activities that the child can't do independently by themselves. I love this because like I said, it works on that interaction piece. It kind of forces the child to interact with us a little bit, um, but it's in a fun way. So these are things like doing big jumps like this girl is doing with her dad, or if we're in a home, just jumping on the couch, letting the child jump and then doing a big kind of crazy one and crashing them onto cushions. A hello goodbye so I that's what I call when we have the child we're holding them like this they have their feet around our waist we look them in the face and we say hello and then we flip them upside down goodbye and then we bring them back up so again it's that kind of adrenaline rush of being upside down and then and then coming back up but we also have that social piece of being very close together and I'm in control of the activity I choose when the child goes down I choose when they come back up Airplane, this one is classic. So this is when you're lying on the floor, a therapist or a parent, you have your feet in the air and the child just kind of flies on your feet like an airplane. Spinning is another great one. So just pick up the child, ready, set, go, and spin, 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 and crash. These are all really movement-based activities. If the child is not so much into that, it's pretty rare, but you will every now and then have a child who's not into those types of activities. Even something like bubbles can be a social activity for children who are not independently able to blow bubbles yet. So they require your help to have the bubbles, then they get to see the bubbles, pop the bubbles, the bubbles go away, and then they have to kind of request for that activity or come over to you to initiate that activity starting again. And again, if we're wearing the forebrain in this activity, it's really great, it's wireless. We can have it on for any of these types of activities without a problem. It's wireless, but it's also really, really sturdy. So I've had, my forebrain has taken an absolute thrashing over the years. Like I've had it for 
like I said, almost three years now, I've had kids rip it off their heads. I've had a kid stomp on it. Like it's taken a beating and it still works perfectly. So definitely don't be afraid to use your forebrain in these kind of more active boisterous games. So music, this one's for our music therapist. I love using music with children with autistic spectrum disorder. I love using music with all the children I work with, but I find it works really, really well with children with ASD. If we're working with younger children, I like to do songs with actions, especially if they're nonverbal. It gives me a way of kind of prompting the child to maybe um, keep the song going. So if we're doing the wheels on the bus, I can prompt their hands like this and help them interact in the song. I like to use a variety of songs. This one is important when we're working with children with ASD because like we said, they can be a little bit inflexible. They maybe have a fixated interest and they might get stuck on one song and kind of sing it in a loop over and over and over and over and over. And so what I like to do to combat that is just to introduce them to a variety of songs. So we're not doing the same songs every session. We're doing different songs, motivating, fun songs. I love to use the songs from Super Simple Songs. So these are um, the pictures that I have along the side. Super Simple Songs on YouTube. I really love this channel. They have all of the classics. So um, the wheels on the bus, heads, shoulders, knees, and toes. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. And then they also have their own versions of some other songs. Like here in the middle, you see they've got a baby shark, but it's the Christmas version. So it's like Santa shark and elf shark and reindeer shark. And that's a really, really fun one. And then musical instruments. Uh, I will use musical instruments in sessions where possible. If I'm doing home-based therapy for children with ASD, a lot of the times the family will have like a guitar or a banjo, you know, like not banjo, what's the word? Ukulele, like a small guitar or a keyboard. And I will try and incorporate um, some music into our sessions that way. And that can be also a nice way for using music with our older children that we're working with. So if you're interested in the super simple songs, I have linked um, to their YouTube page just down there if you were interested. Group therapy. So this is another way that I love to work with children with ASD. So I find this is really great for working on social skills. So like we talked about the interaction piece, eye contact, joint attention, and turn taking, but with a peer rather than just with the therapist all the time. Like it's fun to work with a therapist, but it's, it's better to work with your, with your peers. It helps them to make friends with peers. So like we said, children with ASD can have difficulty making friends. And I find that group therapy gives them a kind of safe space to make friends who are very similar to them. And yeah, they're not going to get made fun of or bullied like can happen sometimes at school because it's a really, really safe, neutral space with peers. It's also a really nice opportunity to work in multidisciplinary teams. So this is my occupational therapist colleague, Cara. We're working together. We're doing a joint speech therapy OT session with these two clients. Um, and it's a really nice way of just kind of getting to know your your other therapists who you're working with but also to include some things that maybe i wouldn't normally include in my sessions or that cara maybe normally wouldn't include in her sessions so it's a really nice opportunity to see how different therapists work and then the last one i like to make sure that i'm choosing children with similar levels of communication for for my part for speech therapy so here we have Inyas and Prithvi both of them are teenage boys both of them are nonverbal and use iPads to communicate so Inyas is actually French speaking Prithvi is English speaking but that doesn't matter so much for the level that they're at where we're just kind of trying to get them to interact and kind of notice each other make eye contact those types of things so here's a little video of them working together First, we're gonna watch this one, which is a more OT-based activity. And then next, we'll watch one, which is the more speech therapy side of it. So here we go. Nice waiting for you. Okay. Yes, it's Whoa. Back. There we go. So there's Inyas throwing the little toys to Prithvi, and now we're gonna have Prithvi thrown back to Inyas. So it's gonna be in English this time. Yep, yeah, this is tricky. Ready? Woo! Oh, 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 oh. It's good for the awareness. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Wait. Wait. In yes. Uh, and yeah, so. Woo! You watch. And nice job. Okay. 
So Cara did a really great job there of getting Prisby to kind of wait and see when Ines was looking at him and ready to catch before she let him throw the toy. So that's a nice way that we use group therapy together. Here is going to be um, a more speech therapy based activity. We're working on flashcards. This is important for when we're working with kids who are using any type of picture symbols system to communicate. We want to make sure that they know that pictures represent words. So here's the activity that we're doing. Half of it's in French for Ines and then half of it's in English for English for Prisby. Montre-moi la table. Mm. Oh, super, bravo, toi. Super. Train, yeah, that's the train. Let's try one more time. Show me the train. Okay, you're listening. So group therapy can also be another way that we use forebrain. We could either have both children wearing forebrain together, or we could do some turn taking with the forebrain. We could have one of them wear it for a certain amount of time and then get them to take it off and hand it over to their peer. This is using peer modeling. So having a peer that's doing the behavior that we want the child to do, um, which can be a really nice strategy to get the child to do what we want them to do. And it also can be working on that turn taking that interaction piece of it's my turn, I take it off and now it's your turn and handing it off to your communication partner. If we are at the age where we're wanting to include some academics for maybe school aged or older children, these are some of the things that I will use. So visual schedule is a really big one. We know that kids with ASD are often really, really strong visually. So I will either, I will mostly often have on the wall, we have like a little kind of picture symbols, visual schedule. We will put first is work time, then we're gonna do hammock, then we're gonna do whatever, nah, 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 nah. shoes on, home time on our visual schedule. And we take the things off one by one as we go. We could also have a working for card. So this is when we have a little card that has maybe a picture of what we're working for. And then we have tokens that we have to get maybe three, maybe five, maybe 10. And once the child has the set number of tokens, they get the thing that they've been working for. So again, just making sure that the child is reinforced throughout the activity. They get to pick their reinforcer, what they're working for at the beginning of the activity. And then they get to work towards it, get their tokens, and then they finally get access to the thing that they've been working for. Another kind of more simplified version of a visual schedule is like a first then. So this is just like a two piece visual schedule. So first hammock, then swing or something like that. Um, there's also the first next then. So that's just adding an extra piece in and um, like you can see up the top there. I've got the link down the bottom if you are wanting to look at that first then visual support. Another one is the time timer. So I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with this. This is a really, really popular one with kids with ASD, but this is a timer that we can like pull out that little red piece, determine the amount of time that we're gonna work for, and then it counts down. It's a really nice visual representation of how much time is left because that red piece gets smaller and smaller and smaller until finally it dings and our activity is finished. So again, I've linked the time timer down there if you were interested. And then important one is movement breaks. I honestly think movement breaks are important for anyone, but especially kids with ASD who have a lot of maybe energy, we're wanting to include movement breaks. So if I'm working in the clinic, we'll do an activity maybe at the table, and then we'll do some movement break on the swing, on the hammock, on the yoga wall. If I'm working in a school setting, we'll do maybe some work at the table in the classroom. And then our movement break will either be like going for a walk outside the classroom, maybe even going outside if we're able to. What now? If we're using, um, if we're working, sorry, with children with hyperlexia, which is way more common than I would have thought when I was studying, I didn't think it would be as common as it is, but I've had a lot of kids who, who have hyperlexia and also autistic spectrum disorder. We can use the forebrain in the more traditional sense. So the forebrain was really designed to be used while you're reading books and you listen to your own voice. So we can do that type of therapy if we're working with kids who are hyperlexic. We can do it for reading stories. So that's what Rayhan is doing here. Um, his story is actually articulation based. So it's not really um, language based. It's more focusing on the specific sounds. And we can also use it at table time. So we're doing it on the floor on our bellies here, which is fine, but we can also do it at the table if we wanted to. So this is an important one. We wanna keep therapy fun, but also functional. So what this means to me is I really like to lean into the child's interests. I wanna meet them at their own level and just show them that I like the things that they like and we can use those in therapy to kind of motivate the child intrinsically. 
we also want to be considering why are we doing this? Um, this is important, I think, the older a child gets, we really need to be looking at whether we're working towards autonomy and whether we're working towards activities of daily living. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, the 22 year old Dylan, who I'm working with at the moment, he came on my caseload when he was 18. So I've had him on my caseload for about four years now. And when he came on my caseload, his parents' concerns were that he couldn't say his L, his L sound. He had difficulty with the pronouns he and she. And he, uh, what, was the, what was the third thing that they wanted me to do? Oh yeah, they wanted me to work on his handwriting. So he had really messy handwriting. He is a child who is hyperlexic, so he can read and he can write. Um, he can spell, that's not the issue, but his, the actual motor piece of his handwriting was just untidy. So for me, out of those three goals, I only thought that the working on the L was really functional. And I think that is because his name is Dylan and then he has three siblings, Caleb, Chloe, and Liam. So everyone in their family has that L sound in their name. So for me, that was an important goal to work on because it has a really functional application into his life. The other two, working on the pronouns he and she and working on his handwriting, I just didn't think they were that functional. He's 18 and to be honest, we don't have to do that much handwriting as adults. So I preferred to teach him how to use an iPad, teach him how to text his family, teach him how to write emails to relatives who live overseas. And then in terms of working on he and she, Dylan was a child who, he, he's one who can physically produce speech, but it's just very reluctant to. So for me, that was a more important goal, getting him spontaneously speaking a little bit more rather than when he can whether he could identify if it's he or she in the picture. Another way that we wanted to support his activities of daily living was we wanted to start including some things to do with money awareness. So he absolutely loves donuts. Um, there's this great donut shop down the road called Bone Shaker. And so we wanted to include his interest, which is donuts, into this activity of daily living, which would be using money. So we went to the donut shop, we took photos of all of the donuts, we got the prices, and then we practiced this interaction at home of buying the donuts. It was just the picture of the donut when we did it at home. And kind of having this exchange of, I want this, here's the money, here's the change. And we're working towards eventually going and doing this in real life at the donor shop. We were actually on track to do it for like March, but then COVID-19 happened and we're stuck inside and the donut shop was closed. So it will be probably in the upcoming months, but it, we definitely got our plans halted by COVID-19. But watch this space. We're going to go and buy donuts together. Um, here is another video of me leaning into a child's interest. So this is little Marvin, who I'm working with. He loves this blanket, but he all he wants to do is kind of sit on his couch and cuddle with it. But it's his interest. I want to include it in our activity. So my goal for this activity is working on body parts. So you can just see how I try and include my goal with his interest in this activity. <laughs> I'm going to put it on your chest. Chest. There's your chest. Ready? Set. On your chest. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to put it on your shoulders. On your shoulders. Where are your shoulders? Here. Shoulders. Tummy. On your tummy. Okay, ready? On your tummy. Are you ready? <laughs> so you can see in that activity, I started off kind of introducing my own agenda into it, into something that he liked, which is working on body parts. And eventually he kind of joined me and he, cho he chose shoulders and then he realized what he actually wanted was on his tummy. So he joined in on that activity and completely did the goal that was for me for that activity. And I think the most important thing when working with any child, especially children with autism, is to be a friend first, to be empathetic and to be fun and to just be their friend. If a child likes us, it's just going to go so much better. They're going to want to listen to us and, and play with us and interact with us. So be a friend first for children with ASD. Next, we're going to look at a little case study. So this is a little boy, Sean, that I worked with a couple of years ago now. So when I met him, he was a three-year-old boy. He had very, very imprecise articulation and this kind of open mouth posture, like the lip was hanging down, just very unclear, slushy speech. 
He was also really reluctant to speak, so he could physically produce speech, but he was mostly just silent, apart from when he was singing songs. So he would just sing songs over and over and over and over to himself, but very reluctant to actually speak and use language in any type of functional way. He was also extremely high energy. So he would do this thing, I called it like a little bunny rabbit. He would put his two hands on the floor and then he'd kick his back feet up and he would just bounce around the house doing this, squealing, and he could do that for absolutely hours on end. Extremely high energy kid. And he also had hyperlexia. So from the time he was three, he was able to read absolutely anything you put in front of him. And I have to say, when Sean came on to my caseload, I was thinking, what am I gonna do with this kid? I had just finished working with another family that had two boys with autism. I was feeling a little bit burnt out, but I was curious and I wanted to see if I could help. So we tried. So therapy, therapy for Sean. He was part of, he had a really big multidisciplinary team. So it, there was me, there was another speech therapist who was working with him at school. He had an ABA team, he had OT. And I think that's it. But he had a really a lot of therapists working with him. So for my, my part, I was seeing him for speech therapy three or four times a week at home. And these are the things we included in our sessions. We did a lot of movement. We always warmed up with movement because that was something that he loved. We used a lot of social activities. For me, the interaction piece for him was absolutely essential. And we used music. We leaned into his interest. We saw that he was always singing songs on a loop. So we wanted to lean into that interest and just help him develop that passion a little bit more. We used the Kaufman speech language protocol to work on his speech. Um, if you're not familiar with that protocol, you can check out my previous webinar on working with speech sound disorders. And then of course we used the forebrain. I was not sure how the forebrain was gonna go with Sean because he was one of those kids who was very hypersensitive, very, aware of noises and I thought maybe it's going to be a little bit overwhelming for him but this is why we should always just try it because we never know because he was one of the kids who ended up loving the forebrain. So here we go we've got two clips of him like I said we included music they had a piano in their house and so I have a little bit of experience playing the piano so I wanted to try and include that in our sessions. The first clip is when we started um, he's not wearing the forebrain in the first clip and the second clip is only one month later, but he's wearing the forebrain. And I want you to just notice the difference in his um, energy and his kind of body language and yeah, like how he is in the first one versus how, how dysregulated he is in the first clip versus how regulated he is in the second clip while he's wearing the forebrain. So here we go. First clip. Let's do it together. Ready? Yes, you're playing. Good. So yeah, all over the show, very high energy, completely dysregulated, no interest in me whatsoever. And in the second clip, we have him wearing the forebrain. I'm just holding his wrist up here for support. So for me, when we put the, the foreground on Sean, I was absolutely blown away by the difference. It had this really grounding, calming, centering effect on him that I found to be absolutely incredible and so beneficial for when we're wanting to work in therapy together. So his progress, for me, it was unbelievable. It looked like two completely different kids from when I started working with him to when um, the family finally moved away. He had really increased regulation. So he wasn't needing to like bounce around the house anymore. He was calmer. He was able to kind of regulate his energy and his emotions. He had increased social interest. I think this is because we did lean into his interests. So we would do a lot of music together. And because of that, he was really interested in me. He wanted to come over to me and he wanted to spend time with me when we were in sessions together. We turned some of his stereotypes into more functional interests. So like I said, he would sing songs on a loop. Um, but we turned that into a more functional interest, which was playing the piano. And he ended up absolutely loving that, loved to learn some of his favorite songs on the piano. And he's continuing piano lessons to this day, even though the family have moved away now. 
We did see clearer speech. Not sure if that was down to just maturing of his oral motor system, if it was to do with the Kaufman speech to language protocol, or if forebrain also played a part with that auditory vocal loop functioning. And then increased focus and attention. This one kind of goes hand in hand with the increased regulation, but he was just better able to focus and attend to activities. Like you can see here, we have him doing this game on the floor. We're finding little pieces for the lunchbox and matching them up to where they go. So like working on food vocabulary and turn taking. And before this activity would have been absolutely impossible. No way. Couldn't even have imagined him sitting for something like this. But afterwards, he was really able to sit and focus and attend because of the therapy that we did. So here are my observed benefits of using the four brain with kids with ASD. So the big one for me is the improved focus and attention. Like we talked about this like grounding, regulating, centering effect of having the forebrain. I won't pretend to fully understand it because I don't, but I have seen it quite a few times with kids with ASD. When you put the forebrain on them, they just kind of are into their bodies and they're less distracted by all the kind of background noise. It's a really, really nice effect of the forebrain. Improved regulation, again, that goes hand in hand with the focus and attention, better able to regulate their energy and better able to regulate their emotions. Increased motivation to participate. So like we said, the kids with ASD who like forebrain really like forebrain and really want to wear it. So the forebrain can actually be a reinforcer in an activity. Increased vocalizations. So again, kids really like to hear the sound of their voice and the kids with ASD really, really enjoyed hearing that extra, just kind of loud, crisp input of their voice when they were speaking while wearing the forebrain. So those are my thoughts about using the forebrain with children with ASD. And if you have any questions, I'm gonna check them out right now. So let me just get rid of this slideshow. Okay, I'm gonna whiz through the comments to see if there are any questions. Hold on one second, just bear with me. Okay, in the beginning of the presentation, I said, okay, yes. Someone is asking whether it's possible to get the recording of the second webinar. Yes, I'll see if I can get Caroline, the lady who does the administration, to, with this webinar, send out the other two links as well, because I did get a number of requests for that in the last webinar too. I don't understand this question about someone's asking about using technology for your client with dyslexia. I didn't talk about dyslexia. So um, I didn't talk about clients with dyslexia today. I think there might've been a misunderstanding. Um, someone again asking about that second webinar. Yes, I will get Caroline to send it through. What do you say to parents with children with ASD who are focused mainly on the language delay? Oh, this is a really tricky one. I mean, for me, early intervention is absolutely key. Um, so I, I don't know if I fully understand this question. So do they not think that the child has ASD? Do they think that the child just has a language delay? That can be a really tricky one. It can be hard for some parents to accept that the child has um, ASD. That can be a really difficult one. And as speech therapists, we often are the first uh, like kind of point of contact for some families because they will be like my child has a language delay the child will come to you you'll be like oh this looks like something a little bit more than language delay so that can be a really difficult conversation to have for some families who are maybe just not ready to accept that it might be something more serious will i email the slides yes um, it won't be me it will be caroline but she will someone says thank you you're welcome thank you for your thank you <laughs> um is there a problem with using the forebrain more often than 10, 15 minutes with adults. I don't work with adults, so I really can't comment on that. I just um, maybe check on the Forebrain website. I got those recommendations from the Forebrain website for those 10 to 15 minutes. With adults, maybe you could check on the website to see if they have any recommendations. You could also try, um, try using it on yourself and see how it feels to use it for longer than 10 or 15 minutes. It's a relatively new technology, so I think we're still kind of discovering how it can be used and how it's best to use it for our client working with handwriting using technology. Okay. Um, is reading aloud for 15 minutes at home adequate if I can't get to SLP? It really depends on what your diagnosis is. I can't comment for on that unless I know a little bit more about you. If the child is nonverbal, do you try to talk to the microphone yourself or not specifically? Yes, thank you for bringing this up. So I will actually do that. I completely forgot to mention this in the webinar. So sometimes if we're doing like music together and we're singing, I might sing like, here, I'm gonna put it on. 
actually I won't put it on. I'll pretend I have a little, here, this is gonna be my child today. Child is wearing a foreframe. We're singing, I will turn the microphone towards myself and then turn it back to them and see if they might vocalize. That's one of the ways that we can kind of prompt or motivate a child who is otherwise nonverbal to vocalize a little bit more is by showing how we can make vocalizations. It doesn't even have to be necessarily words. It could be noises, um, vocal play. Like if you've seen my language delay um, webinar, we talked a lot about vocal play. Those types of noises are easier and more fun than speech a lot of the time, or it could be a song. Um, so I will sing into it. That's not working on the auditory vocal loop. That's just working on a little bit louder input. And then we can turn it back to the child and see if they want to have a go. Hold on one second. I, I'm not sure if I understand this question from Julia. Just they do not focus on the small improvements and are just, oh, okay, it's from the child with Bulgaria. Oh yeah, this is tricky. Um, I mean, I would say that you have to focus on the interaction first. There is a really, really great parent training program by Hannon. Um, it's a Canadian speech and language therapy company, I guess we could call it. Um, the one for children with autistic spectrum disorder is called More Than Words. I haven't done the training yet, but I have colleagues who have. It's next on my list of trainings to get because I think it's a really, really beneficial program. But it's talking about how we can train the parents of children with autistic spectrum disorders to interact with their children a little bit better. So it's called More Than Words by Hannon. That's H-A-N-E-N. -E I think that could be a really beneficial kind of direction to point your client to the one with um, who the parents are not quite accepting that he maybe has ASD just yet. What are the contraindications for using the forebrain? Okay, I'm not, I can't speak to all of these. I can only speak to some of them. So I know for kids who are very hypersensitive, forebrain can sometimes be distressing. I did have one question in a webinar, um, the first webinar we did, about whether people with epilepsy should use forebrain. And I would say, if the epilepsy is caused by startle, then don't do it because um, the forebrain can be a little bit surprising because it's obviously a louder input than we're used to. Um, I'm not sure if there are other contraindications. Might need to check out the website for that one. Does it work for low toned kids? I think you're meaning low muscle tone. Yes. Um, okay, so, uh, Ferry, your question, thank you for it. I did say in the webinar that I'm not gonna to pretend to fully understand how it works with the increased regulation. I don't understand how it works. It's just a really curious effect that I've seen. Um, I was having this discussion with my boyfriend actually yesterday and I was thinking, I don't know, I don't know what to say to this, this webinar because I, I'm explaining this thing that I've seen time and time again and I don't fully understand how it works. And he was saying maybe it's because, you know, when you have the forebrain on, you're very much in yourself and in your body and very much more centered compared to when you have the forebrain off and you have all this air conduction, you have all this kind of background noise coming in that can maybe be distracting, dysregulating compared to when we're wearing the forebrain, we have the bone conduction. It's much more this sensation of being in your head and in your body and connected to yourself. So that was his hypothesis. It seemed to make sense to me, but I mean, I really don't know. I'm just a therapist who likes to use it and I, I don't know why. If it works, it works. And um, what else? Yeah, the, the using the forebrain for, for piano. Yeah, it's really interesting. I've used it myself because I do play the piano still. Um, I'm one of the people who personally doesn't like the sensation of forebrain. Like I find it kind of overwhelming to have that extra loud noise, but I do have very hypersensitive hearing. But I have heard that when you're playing the piano, if you're wearing it at the same time, it can like help speed up the process of learning a new song. So that's another curious side effect. Is it useful if the child has no interest to speak and listen to the song sometimes? Yes, sure, try it out, why not? It's been very impressive. Thank you, you are welcome. Someone's saying vibration through the hair inside the ear and bone. Yeah, forebrain uses the bone conduction. So it's just sitting here. If you have hair covering this part, it still will vibrate and that's fine too. How would you work with a verbal older ASD child? I think I did um, talk about like if we're doing school age type of things, those are the things I would work on. I would still work on interaction. I would still, I would make sure I'm using a lot of visuals. Um, 
what I'm, those are not the kids that I typically work with. I do typically work in early intervention. Is forebrain useful for children with ADHD? So I haven't worked with any children that have a primary diagnosis of ADHD. I've only worked with kind of children who have autistic spectrum disorder and have this kind of crazy high energy. For them, I found it really beneficial. I would say give it a try with a child with ADHD and see if it has that same similar kind of grounding effect. How does it help in speech clarity? So this was, we talked about um, speech sound disorders last week. I'll, I will send through the, the link to that webinar so you can get a little bit more information on that. But for speech clarity, it's really the effect of that auditory vocal loop. So it's boosting your perception, which helps you analyze and then adjust your speech a little bit more. It just basically, basically makes you more self-aware when you're speaking. Okay, I think that is everyone. Has anyone got any more questions or did I miss any questions? We've got a few more minutes before we finish up. I'll give you just a couple of last minutes, just in case. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. Can I show one more time? Do you want me to show the forebrain one more time? Yeah, sure. Okay, so it's funny. It's actually really funny how it sits because it's like this very unusual shape and people want to kind of do this with it, but that's not how it works. So it goes like behind your head, over the ear, and then can you see where it's sitting? It's like on my jaw bone here. I think that's my jaw bone. It's on the little bone that sticks out here. See, it's really not blocking my air conduction at all. It's not blocking my ears. It's just sitting on that bone. And then the microphone, you wanna have it about three centimeters away. Okay, let me just, I have a few more questions coming through. Let me just catch up on them. Do you use forebrain during your sessions? Yes. Or do you offer parents to use it at home as well? So I will every now and then lend mine out to families to take home to try it out to see if it's something that they will use. And a few of the families I work with have bought it to use at home because they feel like it's great. TMJ joint. Yes, thank you. That's what it is. Thank you. This is the name of that, the TMJ joint. Um, my understanding is that forebrain's filtering takes out frequencies that are outside human speech. Yes, that's what the dynamic filter does. Can I describe how it feels to wear forebrain when playing piano? Honestly, you just have to try it out for yourself. It just is unusual. Um, what about vivid and cleaning unit? Oh, yes. Okay. So, I mean, I wipe it down after each use. It's like I said, it's so, so sturdy. You can wipe it down with um, any type of antibacterial cloth and it's fine. And you can also take off this little microphone piece. Oh, mine's stuck with sticker today. Um, but you can take this off. They have replace it, replacement little microphone heads in the pack. So you have a bunch of different ones. You can clean them. You can buy new ones. Mine's stuck. I've got it stuck on with this really tight sticker today. Let me see if I can get it off here. Normally, they're very easy to get off. Of course, the one day where I have to show you how it works, it doesn't want to come off. But you can take the microphone head, head off and clean it or buy new ones. So that's how I do it with COVID-19. So what up? I've almost got this thing off. I don't know why the sticker is so tight. What have I done to it? When I put the new microphone head on recently, I stuck it too, too tight. You can also use it without the microphone head. We do have one in the clinic which doesn't have a microphone head on it and it works just the same. And then, ah, here we go. So this is what it looks like without the microphone head on. It's just like the little piece. And then you can just wipe that with, a, with an antibacterial wipe and it works just fine. Does that answer your question? I'm going to put it back on. Up, up, up. Voila. All right. If anyone has a last question, oh, someone will be glad to see another webinar with me. Give me time to think of a new topic. I'll see if I can. <laughs> I have never worked with children with stroke. I'm sorry, I cannot answer that one. Very tricky, not sure. Um, you're welcome, you're so welcome. Thank you for joining everybody. If you do have any questions, feel free to reply to the follow-up email that we'll send either later this week or early next week. Um, I will answer any questions that I can or try and point you in the right direction if I'm not sure. So thank you so much for joining and I hope to see you at a future webinar. I'm not sure what it will be or when it will be, but I hope to see you there. Thank you everybody, bye.